Thanks uh, very much, Kate. A, a terrific uh, presentation on really the balance between the rights of the patient and the, the need to protect the patient at the same time. Very difficult. I just want to remind everyone that we do have uh, time for questions at the end already. I, I can sense a whole lot of stuff buzzing around people's heads uh, uh, to ask. Um, our next speaker is Marshall Perrin, who is a member of the Northern Territory Country Liberal Party in the 1970s and won a seat in the Legislative Assembly in 1974. When the Territory was granted self-government in uh, 1978, Marshall became Deputy Leader and Treasurer. He was elected as Chief Minister in 1988 and he's a keen advocate of individual rights and he created history when his private member's voluntary euthanasia bill, the, the Rights of the Terminally Ill Act, passed through the Territory Parliament in May 1995. The legislation was, as we know, subsequently overturned by the Federal Parliament in 96, but he nonetheless remains um, active in the voluntary euthanasia movement. And Marshall is going to talk about the historical perspective on the Northern Territory experience. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation today to come along. I'm often asked why I initiated voluntary euthanasia legislation in the first place. And the answer is that I had simply always believed for as long as I could remember that someone who was near death and suffering terribly ought to be able to bring on death to end their misery if that was their wish. It's as simple as that. There was no awful traumatic experience in my life, uh, I'm pleased to say, that drove me to this, what has been described as a reckless act. <clears throat> Tackling decriminalisation of voluntary euthanasia had on, been on my mind for some time in the early 90s. However, I was unsure of the format that such a law should take because there weren't any models to go by anywhere. The catalyst that motivated me to stop pondering the issue and actually do something about it was a conference that I did not attend in Canberra in August 1994. The conference was titled Ethics and Law, The Dying Patient. And it's interesting that the conveners of that conference was the AMA under the chairmanship of one Dr. Brendan Nelson soon to become my arch enemy. <clears throat> but I thank them for sponsoring the conference because I sent for the papers I'd heard the conference was on, saw a notice in a newspaper, uh, and I asked uh, some staff to get hold of the, the papers that would be delivered to that conference. And those papers went on a big pile on my desk, said uh, the pile was to be read if you ever have time. If you don't have time, it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, I did in fact pick up some of those papers many months later. And one of them was written by a Dr. Helga Kuza, director of the Centre for Human Bioethics at Monash University. Her paper was titled, Medically Assisted Dying for Competent Patients. I found that document so compelling, so absolute in its logic and good sense, that I committed myself when I put it down to introducing voluntary euthanasia legislation in the Northern Territory Parliament. I figured at the time that even if I was not successful, my attempt would advance the day when some other politician somewhere would pick up the ball and try again. So the effort that I put in would not be in vain. <clears throat> and I urge Kate uh, Furman to carry on her intentions even if she does feel, when she's about to introduce a bill, that it has a remote chance of success. Please do it. I read all the papers presented to that AMA conference. All the, there were many fors and against the arguments of voluntary euthanasia. And I concluded that if the proposal that I was putting forward was limited to competent, terminally ill adults, the arguments against voluntary euthanasia were emotional and hypothetical and would not stand up to close scrutiny. 
I naively believed that those who supported voluntary euth so, sorry supported euthanasia sorry I naively believed that those who opposed euthanasia on religious grounds could be neutralized by the law requiring every participant necessarily involved in the process the patient doctors nurses even the chemist who supplied the lethal drugs to be acting voluntarily and able from able to withdraw from the process at any stage. It was not to be a law, sorry, it was to be a law that did not require anybody to do anything. If you object to voluntary euthanasia, don't have anything to do with it. Conduct your life if the option, as if the option did not exist. The Victorian Voluntary Euthanasia Society, currently called the Victorian Dying with Dignity Society, was mentioned in one of the conference papers and I contacted them and with their help I drafted a bill. They had put some thought into the concept of a bill at that stage. The title of the bill was very important and I had to select a title that, that uh, was significant. It needed to be easily understood and accurate, accurately portray exactly what the law was to do. This was to be a bill of rights. So what better title could there be? than the rights of the terminally ill bill. Vital assistance was received from Dr. Rodney Syme, uh, Dr. Professor David Kelly, Professor Max Charlesworth, and Dr. Roger Hunt. Uh, some of you will recall of those names are mentioned from time to time. In fact, without their detailed responses to my many questions in writing and verbally, I could not have confidently presented a solid case for voluntary euthanasia. My strategy to winning the debate was to detail exactly what was proposed, to anticipate questions and then answer them in advance, and then widely disseminate that information. If I was going to be attacked from all sides with big guns, I wanted to be attacked for what I was advocating, not for what someone thought I was advocating, or worse, what some mischievous opponent alleged I was advocating. Experience had taught me to try hard to avoid being dragged into an argument that was off subject. I had the answer to every question I could think of. What effect voluntary euthanasia would have on life insurance policies, on guardianship laws? Should there be restrictions on cremation? What would the death certificate say? Would wills be affected? What role should the coroner play? Would national authorities deny NT doctors access to appropriate drugs? How would terminally ill visitors from interstate and overseas be treated? All of these issues had to be thought through with logical answers. For me to be caught out or to admit that something had been overlooked when we're talking about people shortening their lives could spell instant disaster. I recalled seeing John Hewson lose the whole GSD, GST debate and an election because he stumbled over a single answer about a birthday cake. Some of you will recall that too. That's how precarious politics can be. <clears throat> it was never my intention to establish a voluntary euthanasia regime for, regime for the whole of Australia. My jurisdiction was limited purely to the boundaries of the Northern Territory. But in moving to permit voluntary euthanasia for Territorians, I was faced with the prospect of two dying patients in beds alongside each other, both requesting assistance to die, but only one being entitled because the other was a visitor to the Northern Territory. It would clearly be absurd if a doctor was protected while responding to a request from one patient, but risked a murder charge if he assisted the other. As the proposed law was designed to relieve unbearable suffering, I decided it would be wrong to exclude an individual on grounds of their residential status. In hindsight, that was probably a mistake, politically. As the plan was to focus the public debate on what I proposed and not what others might allege I proposed, I had to announce the proposition is an, in an easy to understand form. If the community or politicians became confused or frightened during the passionate debate, the issue would almost certainly be lost. Even giving too much information could be a mistake. If the debate was limited to competent terminally ill adults, 
and the built-in safeguards, there was just a remote chance of success. An element of surprise would help by giving me a day or two in the media explaining my intentions before any opponents could gather their resources and fire a shot back. A draft bill was released together with carefully prepared notes explaining every clause in the bill in layman's terms. An overview paper explaining what I proposed was also released at the same time. The package was posted to every politician, journalist and 300 organisations and key individuals in the Northern Territory. It was really a quite a widespread coverage considering the Northern Territory is not a really big place, population wise. This way, all the people who were likely to comment on the subject or be asked questions had more factual information than would come from the media coverage, which of necessity would have been somewhat limited in detail. I also placed a full page advertisement in the Sunday Territorial newspaper. All of that was released on a single day and caught my opposition by surprise. Part of the strategy was to monitor radio, TV and newspapers to immediately correct every statement made which alleged the bill allowed things that it did not and to answer every query raised about the effects on wills, insurance, etc. I wanted opponents to have to argue facts and relegate the doomsday rhetoric to expressions of opinion. The strategy worked well. By the time opponents mobilised, journalists and the public had a clear picture of how voluntary euthanasia would work under my bill. I knew the plan was working when I heard a journalist pull up an opponent who was going off on a tangent. The journalist said, but that's not what the bill allows. I thought, wow, I've won. They know what it's about and which was the intention. <clears throat> the initial public reaction was supportive although in much stronger terms and more voluminous than I expected. The amount of incoming mail increased as news spread around the country. Supporters poured their hearts out as they related stories of horrific suffering that they had witnessed. I have heart-rending letters from people who through love and compassion have killed a loved one to free them of a tortuous existence. Regretful only that they did not respond to the pleadings to die earlier. It was like I had scratched society and it started to bleed and caused this great outpouring of anger and grief. It had been bottled up for so long. At last these people had someone to confide in who they thought would understand. And this flood of suppressed anguish was completely unexpected. It did, however, serve to reinforce my belief that permitting voluntary euthanasia was the right thing to do. Now, these traumatic killings by inexperienced people out there in our suburbs are without doubt still occurring today, hopefully on rare occasions. Individuals and families having to keep the secret bottled up. In fact, I know it's happening because I know there's someone, at least one person in this room who has been there. The major opponents to what I was doing was the AMA, the churches and right to life groups. They were forceful and well funded. They were also dishonest. The word voluntary wasn't in their vocabulary. Euthanasia was described as murder. The AMA claimed palliative care could deal with all death situations. And a full page ad put on the paper by opponents misrepresented the rights of the terminally ill bill shamelessly. The ad in fact summarised the situation that exists today. Some doctors assisting some patients to die without safeguards or scrutiny. At one stage in the campaign, persons unknown told a group of Aboriginal tribal elders that if the euthanasia law was passed, it would mean doctors could round up sick Aborigines and kill them. This preposterous suggestion was believed and the story spread quickly around remote Aboriginal communities in the Northern Territory. To their credit, even politicians who personally opposed voluntary euthanasia roundly condemned the tactic and sought to reassure Aborigines that the rumours were groundless. 
The coalition of opponents conducted a telephone poll at one stage in the campaign and claimed that the, to the media that the results were just dynamite and they only released selected, selected sections of their findings. When the whole document was eventually prized out of them by the media badgering them for it, it was seen as a complete sham. The poll had comprised over 56 questions, loaded questions, designed to completely confuse the person who they were asking questions of. Uh, they didn't, of the 56 questions, not one of them asked the interviewee if they supported voluntary euthanasia. Now the reason they didn't want that question asked was that the Northern Territory News had already done a poll uh, which returned an 80.6% result. This was back in 1995. Dr Brendan Nelson, the president then of course of the AMA, made a couple of timely public confessions that were a big help to me. The first was a statement that he'd made in July 1994 and I quote, doctors who denied helping patients to die were either inexperienced or dishonest, end of quote. Now that was pretty powerful for me to use, but the further, the good doctor helped me out. In an interview with the Sunday Territorian in May 95, just three days before my bill was debated in Parliament, he said that euthanasia should be an option in the 2% of cases where there was no hope of recovery. And I quote him, my attitude is that in those cases, if assisted death is not an unreasonable course, let those, pa let those individual patients and their families and their doctors make those decisions and let it occur. Technically it would be illegal, but somebody would have to re report it and register a complaint. Now if you do your job properly, there's no way the family's going to complain. End of quote. If you read that slowly and carefully and think about it, it's the most astounding statement from the president of the AMA, who opposed the organisation that opposes voluntary euthanasia. We have the president confirming that doctors do deliberately hasten death if they consider it a reasonable action and the family agrees. But don't tell anyone because it's illegal. Brendan Nelson wanted it kept that way in line with AMA policy. That was 17 years ago. The situation remains today, unchanged. Under the current system, as described by Dr Nelson, the quality of your death may become a cruel lottery. You win if the attending doctor is prepared to risk deregistration or jail for you. The rights of a terminally ill bill was refined following constructive criticism during the public debate and a final bill was introduced into Parliament in February 95. A parliamentary committee was established and received submissions about the bill uh, in order that everyone in the community and just everyone wanted to have a say um, could uh, express it fully and completely through submissions and verbally and, um, and make submissions on the bill. Um, during the debate in Parliament on the bill, every one of the 25 members of the Northern Territory Parliament took the issue seriously. They studied every word, read volumes of submission, attended public rallies. Um, and ensure, to ensure that the final vote was not tainted, tainted by me being Chief Minister, either to curry favour or to kick me, I announced my resignation in advance of the second reading debate. Every single member of the Parliament participated in the debate genuinely and passionately trying to convince every other member to their point of view. It was a parliament of equals. No one voting the way they did because any other voted the way they did. It truly was democracy at its best. And I believe that the, bill, the safeguards in the bill that was first introduced were quite adequate, but we did make some amendments during the debate in parliament in order to get support to have the bill passed. Politics is the art of the possible, and in this case it was an accurate description. I, uh, I will wind up there and say uh, very quickly that there was a legal challenge to the bill when it was passed. Uh, the legal challenge failed. It, it questioned the uh, validity of the legislation. Uh, there was appeal to that legal challenge, and then there was an appeal made to the Prime Minister, who has powers under the Northern Territory Self-Government Act to overturn 
or the Governor General does, to overturn any legislation passed by a Northern Territory Legislative Assembly within six months of its passage. An appeal to Paul Keating was made by our opponents to, for him to veto the legislation before it even started. Uh, to his credit, Paul Keating rejected that approach, uh, saying this is a matter for Territorians, not for the federal politicians. Sadly, some months later, as we know, Kevin Andrews introduced his bill uh, and was eventually successful with the support of a, an enormous religious lobby in federal parliament to have it overturned. I'll stop there and uh, leave uh, the forum to other participants and uh, happy to ask, answer questions later on. Thank you.